Wallace Center for Media and Democracy. He has been studying the intersection of media and democracy for almost 25 years and has worked with foundations, government agencies, and public interest organizations on these issues. His most recent book is Social Media and the Public Interest, Media Regulation in the Disinformation Age. We are pleased to have him speak tonight. And now I will turn it over to Phil. Well, thank you very much. And thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Um, I hope uh, what I have to talk about today is useful and thought provoking. Let me just get my slides up and ready to go. Let me get that thing out of the way. Yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, so um, before I guess, I'll talk a little bit about what we do at the um, DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy. Needless to say, this has been an interesting time, a challenging time, an uh, exciting time. We can use all sorts of different words to describe what it's like to be studying media and democracy um, of late. Um, Scary time. There are lots of uh, words that, that that seem appropriate. But at the uh, but at the Dewitt Wallace Center, we do things like um, we do research on uh, local journalism and the health of local journalism, how to assess the health of local journalism. Um, we do work on fact checking and how to make uh, fact checking effective and accessible to people, uh, and how to. Uh, make it more efficient. We do work on how to make fact checks pop up live if you're watching a debate on television. Um, Bill Adair, my colleague, founded uh, PolitiFact, and so the DeWitt Wallace Center is a real home for, for fact checking research. Uh, we do work on platform governance, um, a, a big topic as of late. It was a big, it was a yet another, I mean, you could lose track of the number of congressional hearings um, that have been held on the issues of you know, the regulation of large digital platforms like Facebook and Google. Uh, and today was yet another uh, congressional hearing on that topic. Uh, so it's a very interesting space uh, to be working these days. My work has been uh, intersected with a lot of these areas. I've done a lot of books that sort of explore the intersection between the political and the economic dimensions uh, of our media system. Uh, so that's one thing they have in common. Another thing they have in common, if you can't tell, is absolutely horrible covers. Um, you know, that's part of my brand identity, apparently. Um, really hideous covers for all of my um, um, So what I'm going to talk about today. Yeah, that's right. Oh, someone's unmuted. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll keep chatting. Um, my plan for tonight um, is as follows. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about what I see as some of the defining characteristics and challenges for our news media today. I'm um, gonna to try to provide in some select spots some, some historical context so we understand how things are uh, evolving. Um, I'm gonna to try to you know, offer my sense of why um, we're, we're seeing some of the different challenges and some of the different phenomenon that we are witnessing today. Uh, and also to talk about why it matters. Um, going to try to sort of identify what I see, the key forces that are at work that are really um, contributing um, to some significant changes in our, in our news media uh, and the larger system in which our news media operate. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about various possible solutions that are in the works uh, to address some of these challenges. Uh, you know, not only in the policy space, but in the nonprofit space, et cetera. Uh, so always try, you know, try to end on a, on a, on a, on a positive note in terms of um, efforts that are, that are ongoing to try to address some of the challenges we, we do face right now. And this is, there is no denying that our, our, our news media um, are, in, are in a challenging moment right now. And we as, therefore, as news consumers as a, and as folks aspiring to be informed citizens, um, are facing some uh, types of challenges that we have not faced before. So let me start with that, you know, some of the characteristics and challenges that we uh, currently face. These are the four 
that I'm going to spend the bulk of uh, my time on. One, and, and some of these you may be familiar with and have feel like you have a good handle on and some maybe not so familiar, but I wanna talk a bit about the nature of the economic crisis that is confronting journalism, not all sectors of journalism, but, but some sectors of journalism uh, and, and the kinds of effects that we know that it's having. Uh, I wanna talk about the rise of partisanship in our journalism. Again, not affecting all parts of journalism equally, but some more than others, uh, but explain why that's happening and, and, and what it means and what, what we know about its effects so far. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this trend towards diminished trust um, in mainstream news media uh, that um, a growing number of, of surveys keeps uh, illustrating uh, and talk about some of the reasons behind that. Uh, and then lastly, I'm gonna talk about this idea of platform dependence. That is gonna talk about the role uh, that large digital platforms like Facebook, like Google and Twitter have in a very short time come to play uh, uh, as uh, important intermediaries in our relationship with news organizations. Not as producers of journalism, they're really not in that space, but as intermediaries uh, between us and the news organizations that we used to access directly. So those are the, are the four um, key concepts I wanna talk about today. Uh, and within all of this, these are the broad forces that are at work to varying degrees and they all sort of impact each other. At various times, I'm gonna be talking about technological change. At various times, I'm going to be talking about economic change. Uh, and at various times, I'm gonna be talking about political change. But none of these things happen in isolation either. They all affect each other. Uh, so that in my rudimentary uh, graphic design way, <laughs> is what I've uh, tried to represent there. So, uh, and I don't mind too, and maybe if it's more efficient on your end, that's fine, but I certainly don't mind if any folks at any time wanna interrupt with questions. Um, I'm certainly comfortable with that. Um, knowing how much, you know, I've done a lot of Zoom with undergraduates uh, and I know um, as I drone on, sometimes uh, it's helpful to, uh, to give them a chance to jump into if they would like. Um, so certainly feel free. Uh, uh, but anyway, so let, let's start um, with the economic crisis in journalism. Um, here's uh, some recent research from the Pew Research Center. Um, this is newsroom employment declines between uh, 2008 and 2019. And if you look at those numbers, right, the number of U.S. newsroom employees uh, in thousands, you know, it's a steady decline. Line, it's certainly not catastrophic, uh, but it's but it certainly is a steady decline. So that's one lens to look at what's happening uh, in newsrooms. Um, now, here's a different way of looking at it. Uh, this is newsroom employment at U.S. newspapers around uh, over that similar time frame. This is where I have to, I forget to double check before I do this. I'm colorblind, so I can't sit there and tell you what color line that is that's going down. Um, red? If I'm, if I'm close, great. <laughs> feel free to correct me. Uh, but we see a downward. Uh, maroon. Maroon, I was close. That's closer than I usually get. <laughs> um, so we see a downward trend in terms of newspaper jobs and a slight upward tick in other news producing industries. This is largely where we're starting to talk about the digital space, online news sources, et cetera. But what's happening in newspapers is a dramatic decline. And let's see if I can go two for two. Uh, the orange line is the other news producing industries. Yes, no? Maybe I got it. Um, so, uh, and, and again, you might think, okay, whether it's newspapers or other types, you know, Maybe the, the, the nature of the medium doesn't matter. Um, but importantly, when we're talking about newspapers, we are in you know, the newspaper model in the US, what we're really talking about there are our local sources of journalism. And that's where uh, it's sort of gonna be a key theme you're gonna be talking about. Uh, it's at the level of local journalism, at the level of individual communities, where the economic impact, the economic, you know, uh, 
downturn has been most dramatic. Um, this is a statistic showing the uh, losses the you know, in the total number of US newspapers. We can see uh, declines uh, that are fairly dramatic in the neighborhood of 2,000 newspapers going away um, over the past decade and a half or so. Um, so what we're really losing here are many, many of the daily newspapers uh, or weekly newspapers uh, that serve smaller communities around the US. Um, some of you may have heard the term news deserts. Um, it's a term that's, that, that's frequently used these days, actually coined by um, our dearly departed colleague from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Penny Abernathy, who's done, you can see there it says, even though I'm from Duke, I am indeed citing a UNC database. Don't tell anybody. Um, but um, Penny has done some of the most important work in chronicling um, this decline, this loss in daily newspapers around the country. Um, now, why this matters uh, you know, in, in this day and age, why concern ourselves with newspapers? Um, keep in mind that we're not, you know, as much as we're using that term um, over the course of this past decade and a half, virtually all of these newspapers also did have an online presence, of course. So we're not really lamenting or fretting about the loss of paper per se, but of what those organizations have done. And here's a study that we did at the DeWitt Wallace Center, where what we tried to do was get a sense of which types of local news sources are the most significant sources of original reporting in communities. So in a national study that we did, I'll just walk you through these data a little bit. We, did, we compiled a national database of news outlets uh, or actually a sample from 100 randomly sampled communities around the country. Newspapers, if you can see there in the, in the, in the second column that says percentage of outlets, newspapers accounted for 25% of the outlets in our database. But if you look at the next column, they accounted for basically 47% of the original stories in our database. So what that tells us is newspapers, even in, this is a very recent study, even in their dramatically diminished state in terms of there being fewer of them and in terms of there having fewer journalists working at them, they remain um, by far the most significant source of local reporting in most communities of original uh, reporting. Um, well out of proportion with the percentage of the outlets that they represent. If you look, for example, at television, there are, you know, television represents about, you know, 14% of the outlets in our, in our random sample, and they contribute only about 12% of the original stories to our, this massive database that we constructed of, of news stories. So not really uh, operating out of proportion with the share of the, of the sources that they represent. Radio actually represents 51% of the outlets in this national database that we put together, and less than that in terms of, you know, contributing, really punching below their weight in terms of the percentage of original stories that they accounted for in our database. And probably the most important part of this uh, table is the last one, uh, the last line that says online only. Uh, and as you can see there, online only outlets, that is what we call the digital native outlets, the type of local news sources that have begun to emerge uh, over the past decade or so, the type of news sources that foundations, for example, have spent an incredible amount of money trying to incubate and trying to uh, experiment with and trying to help them really establish footholds in local communities as important sources of, uh, of reporting, of, of original journalism. And you can see there that these, these sources um, still only, they account for only about 10% of the outlets available across all the communities that we studied and about 10% of the original stories. So they are a relatively small part of the local news ecosystem at this point in time. So I bring that up to just to emphasize again, 
why, you know, why we should care at this point about the, the economic hardships that are confronting newspapers. And the short answer there is no other sources of news and information have really stepped up yet to contribute uh, in the way that newspapers traditionally have and relatively speaking still, still do. Professor Napoli? Sure, yes. Well, maybe you get to it. Did, you, did your study look at all in the factual quality of that coverage? That is such a great question. That's our next step. We want to figure out how to essentially apply the kind of fact-checking methodology that gets applied to politicians and start applying that to actual reporting. Uh, and it's interesting you bring that up because I'm going to talk a bit about some of the new types of local news sources that are emerging. And some of them are giving us reason to be concerned about the, the, the you know, how factual, how accurate, how reliable uh, local, these local news sources are. The irony here is that, and we, we'll talk about this when we talk about trust, local news sources have traditionally been very trustworthy, um, very objective, you know, things that we generally value quite a bit, but we're, that's part of the change that we're starting to witness, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a minute, which is, which is very distressing, actually. But here are some things we know about what happens. And there's a, a number of colleagues of mine are, are doing really interesting research on what happens in communities when local news either declines or goes away. So these are, this is just a sampling of the kind of things that we see in the data at this point. We know, for example, that as local news disappears in a community, we see the levels of political knowledge decline. This is a, you know, basic things. If you ask people, you know, who's your mayor? I think, you know, things of that sort. Knowledge of those sorts of basic facts goes down as the local news sources diminish in a community. Um, we actually see less political participation. Voting levels decline when the local news sources disappear in a community. Of course, this means less gov government oversight. We have seen this in so many communities around the country, even at the state level. At this point, um, you know, there's barely anybody covering the state house in most states. And so if you go trickle down to things like city council meetings, school board meetings, things of that sort. Um, those are often not being covered by any local reporters anymore. Here at Duke, we, we run a paper called the Ninth Street Journal. Um, and it turned out that our student, uh, you know, reporter for the Ninth Street Journal was the only one covering the school board um, in Durham. Uh, and it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't, you know, I mean, they're great students and all, but it shouldn't be a uh, you know, a 19 year old undergrad being the, the sole source of, of, you know, watchdog coverage of what's happening at, at school board meetings. Um, so we're seeing less government oversight and that's been very well documented. Um, we actually even see more polarized voting patterns. That is you see less split ticket voting at the local level when local news sources go away. Uh, and that gets to something we're gonna talk about in a minute, which is sort of the vacuum that gets created uh, when these local news sources goes, go away, it actually tends to sort of defer people's attention increasingly to national news, which has a, uh, you know, is, has a, is more established in being partisan and highly polarizing. So all this points to a, a variety of different kinds of indicators of ways in which the, de the decline of local news can deteriorate the democratic process a bit um, from, from obvious things like voting going down uh, and you know, what you need to know to be a well-informed voter uh, to some less obvious things. And I can emphasize enough that this is just a sample. Um, and I, you know, there's a range of other concerning effects uh, that research just over the past five years or so uh, has, has, has shown um, declines in local news to, uh, to have. Now, why is this happening? Um, 
I'm going you know, I'm going to try to give a little historical perspective. Oh yes, Patricia, I see your hand up. Uh, yes, I was concerned about investigative reporting. I noticed that the NNO really no longer does a lot of that, and I remember a really deep dive into uh, workers' compensation and companies that weren't carrying that. And then uh, I heard the reporter who did that investigation speak about it. And then she left the NNO and not too very long ago, I saw where a lawsuit was settled um, regarding some of her investigation. But I realized that as readership goes down and the newspapers hemorrhage money, there is no money for that kind of reporting. And that is concerning. No, that was a, an excellent point. Uh, yeah, local, you know, investigative reporting is time consuming and expensive um, and doesn't necessarily attract, unfortunately, a larger readership than another story um, about what Kim Kardashian tweeted today. Uh, in our database, just on that example, I cannot tell you how much of our database at this point of stories are stories of, a, you know, a news outlet writing a story about what somebody tweeted. That is a very cheap type of story to write. Uh, and so there's a lot of that. But investigative reporting um, has indeed been in decline. Uh, my predecessor at the DeWitt Wallace Center, Jay Hamilton, uh, if you want to read, uh, you know, I love to throw out book uh, recommendations all the time. There's a fascinating book about the evolution of uh, investigative reporting in the US called Democracy's Detectives. And he, Jay Hamilton was an economist. And he essentially quantifies the economic impact of local investigative reporting going away. It's, it's an incredible book. Uh, cannot recommend it enough. Um, so yeah, really important point. Uh, now, uh, so when we try to get at why, you know, why the economics of, of local journalism in particular, but also national journalism, they, those have evolved, but why this has happened, I wanna take us back in time a bit I sort of think of this as a two-stage process. Stage one involves these folks. This is early 2000s. eBay, Craigslist, Monster. These are just some of the examples. These are businesses that sprouted up essentially out of the recognition that the kind of advertising that newspapers contained was so valuable to us, that you could build freestanding businesses on it. The classified ads, the boring old archaic classified ads were the economic engine of local newspapers. And the part about this that's particularly important is that it's advertising that was valuable to us. Economists have actually shown that the more advertising that was in a newspaper, that that would actually drive readership up. Think about that for a minute. Would you ever watch a TV, would you ever watch more TV if it had more commercials? No. Oh, I love this radio station. It plays more commercials than the other station. Of course not. But the nature of the kind of advertising that was always the bread and butter of newspapers, classified ads, coupons, auto dealership sales, department store sales, Movie advertising, what time is the movies playing? You know, we're going back in time here, obviously. But all that kind of advertising had actual value to the news consumers. Uh, and it meant that you could actually take those kind of, take that kind of advertising and start these kind of businesses that were really about providing a platform for that advertising. And so that's when the, you know, the advertising revenue stream begins to get damaged. And by the time, cannot emphasize this enough, by the time the early 2000s roll around, newspapers were earning about 75% of their revenue from advertising and about 25% from us. So we were paying a really small part of the freight for producing journalism. So that was bad, but unfortunately it got worse. This is when we get to stage two, uh, you know, a decade or so later when the platforms become such a prominent part of our media ecosystem. And what they do is further siphon off more advertising revenue. Google's, Facebook's, YouTube's, now what they are able to do 
is provide a degree of what we call micro-targeting to advertisers that a news source, a news site simply cannot compete with. The Facebooks and the Googles and the YouTubes have literally thousands of data points on every user and you can target, you've seen this, you've experienced this, you might have, you know, visited an ad for something online and man, Facebook, YouTube, Google, they know it and that product category follows you. I browsed some watches the other day on eBay and as far as the my entire laptop is concerned, I want nothing but watches at this point. Every application I open <laughs> is filled with watch ads of some sort or another. Um, but what and, and so that now represents for advertisers a much more appealing mechanism, even at the local level, of how to reach people. Because the old model of buying an ad in a, in a, in a new on a new site pales in comparison to what you can do with a Facebook, where you might say, "I want to reach people between 20 and 35 who live in these zip codes and who have an interest in beer." Uh, and who have an interest, you know, in the outdoors, that level of, and, and of course, you could take it to other levels who have, who are conservative leaning, who are liberal leaning, who voted in the last election, who didn't vote in the last election. The data profiles that these platforms have on us are massive and advertisers love to leverage that. There's just no way that news sites at the national level, at the local level, television, online, print, whichever one you want to point to, that they can compete with that. So it's a really has been a, a you know, two wave attack on the advertising model that has supported uh, journalism for quite some time. Anyone, any questions on that, just let me know. So now let's switch gears and talk about uh, the phenomenon of partisanship. We know this, especially on TV, we see it online, we see it. Um, a lot of what we call journalism today or what calls itself journalism today doesn't really fit the traditional definition of journalism. Um, it is a, opinion, um, you know, that's in theory building upon some actual reporting that was done, but perhaps offering an interpretation that doesn't have much grounding in the original reporting or even in the original facts. The examples I'm putting up there now are, are all national news sources, but right now we're doing some work. Uh, this is metric media. You may or may not have heard of it. There's about 40 metric media hyperlocal news sites operating in North Carolina. There's about a thousand of them operating around the country. Um, these are highly partisan local news sources that are beginning to emerge, filling the vacuum in many ways that was left by the decline of, of so many local newspapers. So it's an interesting evolution uh, that's happening. Uh, and now again, we may disagree uh, or agree on, you know, how valid the traditional notion of sort of objective nonpartisan journalism really was. Um, we don't want to, um, you know, be naive that that was perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but definitely we are, uh, you know, in the midst of, 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 a, of a fairly dramatically different version of journalism, certainly at the national level. And that's the key point here. That's beginning now to find its way to the local level in which, um, you know, more extreme partisanship on, on, uh, on both sides of the ideological spectrum um, is, is emerging. Now, why this matters? Again, we may have, you know, you, you, you may have, you know, feel like, ah, you know, if you look at the early days of journalism in the in this country, in the the very earliest days, it was partisan. So we're sort of going back to the uh, uh, to the origins of how journalism was in this country. That's absolutely true. Um, but recent studies tell us this, and to me, this is the most important, you know, part of the why this matters. Unfortunately, and this applies again to both sides of the political spectrum. Partisan media outlets are significantly more likely to disseminate inaccurate news and information um, than uh, what we might call mainstream or what we might call uh, nonpartisan uh, news sources. Uh, and again, you might say, well, how do you measure partisanship? Well, we're, we've gotten pretty good at that. Um, there's, and there's a number of um, organizations that essentially 
that's the service that they provide. So whatever news sources you're using, you can access a variety of, of rating services, essentially, that will tell you uh, where, where, you know, with a lot, when a lot of data are analyzed, where the source you're relying upon falls uh, on the partisan spectrum. And that's, and that's a useful thing to have access to these days. Um, another reason why this matters, of course, is as our news media, both nationally and locally, become more partisan, that does tend to exacerbate uh, the political polarization that we are in the midst of in this country. When we track trends in political polarization over time, um, we're near a peak right now. Uh, and, and, and to put this in perspective, some of you may be aware of this, some of you maybe maybe would or not, but if you go back and look at, at the same measures of polarization that we use now, when we applied those to voters in the 50s and the 60s, can you imagine this? That it was difficult to distinguish between Democrat and Republican voters, that uh, there was that much commonality in terms of where they stood on various policy issues. So, you know, just to, just to mention that bit of historical context to sort of remind us, you know, of where we've been and how where we are now is, is, is quite different. Um, you know, it's, it's been a while now that we've been highly polarized. So we sort of, you know, I think treated as the new normal um, or not so new normal really, but certainly the normal, uh, but important to remember that it was not always the case. Uh, and it is interesting that there does seem to be some correlation for, with, you know, the part of how partisan our news media were at those earlier points in time compared to now. There certainly seems to be a correlation. The causal issue is, is, is something else. Uh, but certainly what this does is undermines the availability of uh, shared facts uh, that do provide the foundation of a deliberative democracy. Um, as our news media become more polarized, the ability for people to come together and have you know, policy discussions and reach compromises uh, becomes very difficult if they're not a set of shared facts that become the starting point for those policy deliberations. Now, why is this happening? Why, have our, why is this polarization phenomenon uh, become such a prominent characteristic of, of our news media today? Um, the short answer is money. Um, but there's two dimensions to this. One is, and we really cannot emphasize this enough, um, partisan journalism attracts eyeballs, attracts readers um, very successfully, very successfully. It is, you know, it, you know, and that says something about us as news consumers, certainly. So we uh, bear a, a big part of the responsibility for this pattern. Okay. Uh, in this environment that we have now, and we've had for a quite a, no, a long time now, where our media environment has become so fragmented and news outlets have to pursue sort of niches, right? I mean, we originally had our big three broadcast networks, and each of them was trying to appeal to as large an audience as possible um, across the political spectrum. They had, therefore, an economic motivation to sort of aim right down the middle. But you start adding cable networks, and you add CNN, and you add more and more news sources to the mix, their strategy is not to try to aim right down the middle. It's to target narrower niches. So that's provided an economic incentive for um, this tendency toward polarization. The other part of this, as I mentioned before, you know, investigative reporting is, is expensive. Most kinds of on the ground reporting is more expensive than having somebody sit in front of a camera and spew their thoughts on the news of the day, which if you watch you know, cable news, name your cable news network, that's really what you're getting, interestingly enough, if you're watching primetime. Um, so that's, you know, now the irony here, of course, is that they spend then millions upon millions of dollars on the personalities that they pay to put in front of the camera. Uh, but very little on actual reporting. So you're, you know, if you are watching a cable news network after eight o'clock at night, you're really not getting journalism. Uh, but you're getting, you know, it, that's the kind of journalism that's on in prime time because that's the kind of journalism that attracts the most eyeballs. Uh, so it's, you know, so there's, a, you know, a set of economic incentives here that we have to recognize. Uh, reason number two: um, shifting motivations. That is. As we've seen how the economics 
of uh, particularly at the at the local level, uh, you know, there's nothing particularly appealing about the local news business at this point from an economic standpoint, which opens up or you know leaves really political motivations to be involved in this space. So a lot of our newer, uh, you know, I point back to my metric media example, some of our newer entrepreneurs in the local journalism space um, are really motivated first and foremost by political influence. Metric media was the subject of a really interesting um, expose in the New York Times last year uh, that showed in fact that they were taking payment not from advertisers, but from political consultants. You pay us and we will do stories on the candidate you want us to do negative stories about. Uh, very different model of local journalism than we are accustomed to. And that they will work strategically with political candidates to present a version of journalism uh, that can influence elections. We have found, for example, that these sites have popped up much more prominently over the past few years, they, they were popping up quite frequently uh, in, in the run up to the last election, and they're much more prominent in swing states than they are in other states. Their um, journalistic output is much more um, robust in these swing states than in other states, where in fact they just run stories, the same stories on every outlet, and those stories are actually generated by algorithm. That it's just the lowest cost, cheapest. Uh, you know, form of journalism that you could possibly do. So we see what appear to be um, political influence strategies motivating not only the distribution of journalistic resources, but also their output and behaviors. Nope. All right. Oopsie, excuse me. Now we move to the question of trust. How am I doing on time? I'm doing all right. I have too much left to do. Um, here is a recent survey, uh, and if you follow that blue line, I think I got that right. Um, this is from, you know, fairly recent from 2012 to the present. You could see a very recent precipitous decline in terms of the percentage of Americans who trust traditional media. Uh, it's interesting to see that there was actually an, in an increase going, according to this survey, uh, from 2016 through 2019. Now, where it gets particularly interesting is with this next slide from a different survey from Gallup, charting trends over time, um, Americans trust in the news media by political party. Uh, and here you can see the Democrats as the blue line, um, an actual upward trend of late. Uh, and of course, the Republicans uh, as a red line um, and a significant downward trend of late, but generally a gap between them that dates at least as far back, um, excuse me, as the late 90s, okay? And again, this ties us back to the issue of partisanship that we talked about before. Um, as we have all these different partisan news sources, a big part of what they do is criticize each other. Uh, and so people are being fed, wh whether you're Republican or Democrat, are often being fed a lot of information that um, from the news media that they do consume that is about denigrating the work of the other news media that they probably are not consuming, but they might have if they didn't receive so much negativity about it. Um, so, um, I mean, and I, you know, I don't think I have the full set of explanations for why we see this partisan gap, um, but I think it goes to things like, um, you know, what are, you know, different, you know, strategies that political leaders employ in elections. Uh, I think certainly part of it is that, you know, there is certainly fundamentally something about journalism, you know, that its mission is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, uh, as they like to say, um, that certainly probably puts journalism uh, more to the left of center uh, generally than to the right of center. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of factors at work but probably for us, what is most concerning is that the gap is widening in terms of who trusts our news media uh, and who does not. Uh, and once again, takes us back to that question of how do we reach a set of shared facts upon which political deliberations can be built, uh, built upon. Why does this matter? Oh, I sort of already said that, didn't I? I'm proud of myself. 
Um, we really do need shared facts and a deliberative democracy. Also, though, these declines of trust then intertwine with and take us back to the issue of the economic decline of journalism. If a large swath of the population uh, does not trust our mainstream news media, um, they're not going to pay for it uh, and they're not going to spend time with it. Uh, so it's, a, it's, you know, the trust problem is also an economic problem for journalism. And the news industry is investing lots of time and resources and thought uh, into how to reverse this trend of declining trust in journalism. And they're doing, you know, they're working on things like greater transparency. They're working on things like enhancing how they engage with the communities. I could do a whole other presentation on, on, on the ways news organizations are experimenting with how to overcome the trust problem. Um, but of course, too, we have to think of this declining trust as both a cause and a consequence of the rise of hyperpartisan journalism. Why is this happening? A lot of reasons. Uh, certainly, our political leaders um, do engage frequently in attacks on the news media, uh, and that certainly affects people's perceptions. Um, as we've mentioned, we're seeing growing partisanship both in the in the news audience and in the news outlets, which leads partisanship leads to greater distrust of our of our mainstream news outlets. Uh, and these declining economics of journalism that I mentioned before, which, and again, we, are, we do not want to uh, make news organizations blameless in uh, these patterns that we see. Uh, certainly, the economic declines that they are experiencing are creating, unfortunately, more powerful incentives to do sensationalistic journalism, um, to not be as uh, careful in fact checking and things of that sort, to not follow the traditional norms of journalism the way that they used to. In journalism, we used to hear this phrase used all the time about the separation of church and state. And that referred to the editorial function of journalism operating with a, a wall between them and the advertising folks, the management folks, et cetera. Nobody talks about the separation of church and state anymore. The economics of journalism have essentially, you know, decimated that wall. Uh, and so that too is a big shift in journalistic norms has meant that economic considerations are playing a much greater role in decision-making about what gets reported on and how it gets reported on than it used to, uh, which can again too boomerang back and affect trust. Okay, lastly, Platform dependence, a term you may be familiar with, but may not. Um, I have borrowed this visual. Oh, now I forgot who I borrowed it from. Uh, that's terrible. Oh, um, a colleague at Columbia University, um, Emily Bell, did a great report called Platforms in the Press, uh, if you're interested. And this is where that comes from. Uh, but this visual is meant to represent these layers of essentially intermediaries now that operate between us and the news organization. So if here's the if CNN is the example, and if CNN is producing journalism, well, first you might access it through the range of CNN apps. Um, then there are all those video platforms uh, that intermediate us on the TV front. And then there are all these social media platforms uh, that um, you know we often use as our mechanism for accessing news. And then in this model, we even see the various devices, which sometimes engage in some of their own editorial work uh, in terms of what we see and what we don't see. So this is a lot of layers that journalism has to travel through to meet us. And at each stage in the process, there are technological uh, and social factors that do influence the nature of the stories that we're ultimately exposed to. This is a very different model from then from going to access CNN directly on your TV or go or reading the New York Times or reading the Wall Street Journal or accessing their websites even directly. So these platforms and we all you know, take stock of ourselves. We probably know people who, um, you know, if it's not the platform putting the news in front of us, that we don't access it directly anymore. Did I see somebody pop up in the chat with a, with a question or a comment? Uh, feel free to dive in if you do. 
Yeah, we, we have a couple questions um, and if we can, I can ask them now or wait until you're done. Sure, I mean, if they're relevant to what I'm talking about now, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to shoot right to it. Okay, well, the, the most current one that just came up is, how do you think the acceleration of the speed of the news cycle contributes to the decline of fact checking in our traditional journalistic platforms? Oh, that's a great question. Breaking news. That's a great question. Um, and, you know, and to put that in historical context, that was the big debate when CNN first came along, since I've got CNN on my screen right now. You know, why would there be the need for a 24-hour news network? And if you and if you are a consumer of the 20, a 24-hour news network, you'll notice the, the news seems to operate in a fairly continuous loop. Um, but it, yeah, the time pressures now to get news in front of people immediately uh, are tremendous. Um, and my, you know, um, does that create pressures to not follow all the traditional journalistic norms in terms of sourcing and verifying? Absolutely. It absolutely does. And especially in an environment that's grown at the same time, increasingly uh, competitive, um, which is, again, seems counterintuitive when we're talking about resources diminishing. But, um, you know, the barriers to entry are quite low. And again, you know, the business of producing very cheap journalism that's essentially recycling other original reporting is one that is really the primary business model in this whole news ecosystem. So I, I have a, another question also. Sure. Um, you know, with this current slide that's up there, we, we have news, well, let me rephrase that. We have information coming at us from all these different sources and um, and trust is declining, and yet we're being bombarded from everywhere. Right. Is there a role for government in all of this, and ensuring that you know when someone makes a claim that this is new, that they're actually a journalist reporting the news, that it is is indeed the news that's being reported, and not some opinion about nice. the news? That is a great question. Now I'm going to get to it. Um, in, a, in a slide or two, uh, and talk about some of the type of government interventions we used to have that we don't have anymore that address that that very that very concern. So okay. hold on. I will, I'll, 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 be, I'll be circling to that in a, in a few minutes. Um, and it's interesting; people are asking that same question about the platforms at this point. Should there be government regulation of these platforms that put more responsibility on them to be? effective arbiters of what's true and what's false, of what's news and what's opinion. Um, so if we think about these new, these new intermediaries, um, it's not just, it's also each other. You know, if you are a user of a social network, the news that gets put in front of you is not only a function of your own preferences, who you choose to follow, et cetera, um, the information that you provide to the algorithm, but it's also of the users in your network. So we are all gatekeepers of those other people in our network. These are the, you know, it's friends, family, et cetera, celebrities who are putting news stories in front of us. And what we know now today is that the average social media user trusts the individuals in their social network more than they trust news organizations. So your friend can share with you something from some source you've never heard of. But because it was shared with you by your friend, you are likely to trust it. So that's a very different dynamic than we've traditionally had. And then, of course, which again is a whole giant can of worms and was the topic of today's congressional hearing, um, we have these algorithmic content curation and recommendation systems. Here we're talking about the algorithm controls the Facebook news feed, the algorithm that controls the next thing that YouTube recommends to you. Um, we're, this is a very, very active area of research today for everybody in my field. And we are discovering all sorts of ways in which these systems are oriented towards, unfortunately, prioritizing a lot of times inaccurate content, inflammatory content, polarizing content, uh, content that generates strong emotional responses. None of these things are things that necessarily correlate with good journalism. So it creates it puts in front of us a subset of the journalism that might be out there um, that's not ideal, 
And yet it also creates for these news organizations an incentive system to produce specifically more of that kind of content. So these algorithmic content curation recommendation systems um, you know, have been hugely influential in completely reconfiguring how folks, uh, you know, what sort of news people are exposed to. But I don't, we don't want to put all the blame there. We also have to recognize that our individual social network, individuals in our social network are playing a dramatic role as well. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, these both of these impose some problematic different criteria than what we think of when we think about traditional news values in terms of determining what gets put in front of us. Um, I also think, people might not agree, but I think in many ways social media platforms represent a new degree of passivity in how we consume news. There's a very famous quote that has, you know, come to sort of epitomize the nature of the social media news consumer. And it is this, and this came from a focus group from a decade and a half back now, but if you Google it, you'll find it referenced everywhere. If the news is important, it will find me. If you unpack that, you realize that really represents an incredible amount of passivity. If you're just saying, look, if it's not showing up in my Twitter feed, then it's not important. That is a really, I think, problematic way to be a news consumer. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to start going a little a, faster now. Question? I have a quick question. Yeah. Sure. So this curating that you're talking about, that news being pushed towards us, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, New York Times and Wall Street Journal are also doing this in a sense when they show you on the side, these are the stories that are trending. Absolutely. Why, why do that? And there's a, you know, we, we call that, you know, in the academic world, institutional isomorphism, which basically means copycatting. They are trying because the data tell them that that is a way of making their site, as we call it, stickier, that it will get you to stick around, that if they, you know, they do have data, they have, they have some information on what your preferences are. So if they can make some personalized recommendations to you based on your previous story habits, reading habits. These are things that we think you will find interesting. That is an effort to try to, um, you know, take advantage of uh, and leverage that information that they have. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned the New York Times because years back, they, they floated the idea of going to full personalization on the homepage. If you, if you would go to newyorktimes.com, imagine you getting a completely different homepage from me in terms of the stories that are presented. They backed away from that after they received some criticism of it. But the New York Times even uses an algorithm called Blossom that tells them which of the hundreds of stories they publish each day will perform best on social media. They can't put all the stories they publish every day on social media. So Blossom helps them figure out based on historical data, what will perform best, what's most likely to go viral on social media. So in many ways, the, you know, the values, the tech company values that have come to characterize these social media platforms have definitely infiltrated news organizations who are trying to use the same tactics um, you know, to the extent they can with the data they have at their disposal. So that was a, a good point that you made there. Um, and then lastly, we have to remember that these platforms then do also, this platformization, um, at, while they're also serving as an important distributor for news, they are siphoning off massive amounts of ad revenue that might have otherwise gone to news organizations. Now, there are three primary reasons why this is happening, and this goes to how it helps advertisers, how platformization helps news organizations, or they thought it did, and how it helps us. As I've mentioned, advertisers love these platforms as a much more targeted, data-rich, and efficient advertising model. So that gravitated uh, the advertising dollars there. For us as internet users, I like to think of these social media platforms as web funnels. Some of us are old enough to remember the days of surfing around the web, looking for stuff, relying on search engines, et cetera, following links. Well, platforms provide much more of a one-stop shop and sort of bring things from across the internet to us, making the internet more of a push medium and less of a pull medium, so to speak. And for news organizations, platforms were tantalizing because they offered these large aggregations of audiences in one spot, 
that then that they can put their content there and not have to work as hard to try to drive traffic to their websites. So this confluence of factors is what allowed these platforms become as dominant of players in our news ecosystem as they have become. Now, what can and should be done? This is where we start to ask questions about what might the role of government be or others. Um, there is a bill floating through Congress right now called the Local Journalism Sustainability Act that would provide uh, tax credits uh, and public, some public support uh, for local journalism, something that we've never had much of uh, in this country, though certainly other countries do quite a bit more of it. Um, platforms, how about these big digital platforms that have become these important intermediaries that have siphoned off all the ad revenue? How about they help cover the costs of journalism? Yep, they're actually doing that. Uh, in some cases, just freely offering up hundreds of millions of dollars, which to them again is, you know, really is a drop in the bucket. Uh, Facebook, Google, for example, uh, are you know major supporters of journalism now. In the in um, you know, and some people might argue, well, that's just a cynical way of sort of uh, staving off regulation. Uh, let's start throwing some money at journalism uh, as a way of um, you know currying some 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 political goodwill. But there's also uh, places not in the U.S. yet. Uh, but where it's been, become mandatory. In Australia, and this has been in the news quite a bit lately, a mandatory news and digital platform bargaining code was instituted earlier this year, and it requires negotiations between news organizations and digital platforms so that the digital platforms will compensate news organizations for the content that they distribute. Uh, some form of platform regulation you know, this is where we get to the, some of the misinformation and disinformation questions. Some of you may be familiar with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It's been in the news a ton lately. Basically, what this gives platforms is immunity from civil liability for anything that they distribute from third parties. Some people are saying that maybe that should be repealed or revised to try to create an incentive system so that platforms might do a better job of favoring uh, reliable news and information rather than, you know, a lot of the disinformation that's out there. Some people have said we should take something called the fairness doctrine. Some of you may be familiar with this. The fairness doctrine applied to broadcasting in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and the fairness doctrine required broadcasters to provide balanced coverage of controversial issues. Could we or should we imagine a fairness doctrine for social media platforms so that they had to provide some sort of balance of opposing viewpoints? Is, you know, I could go on on that forever. In fact, I have a whole separate presentation on that um, that I've been doing quite a bit lately. But that goes to the question before about whether, you know, that's our most explicit role government has played in sort of affecting journalistic content. Beyond that, you know, the First Amendment has been uh, a very, very powerful uh, force for, um, you know, preventing more aggressive government uh, intervention in this space. So oftentimes in, in, in then uh, in lieu of that, and we're seeing this now, uh, a lot of antitrust action, breaking up these big platforms to try to create a, more, a greater diversity of sources out there and might that facilitate um, a more, you know, a, I, I, and I'm, you know, it's hard to, to say how that would actually solve or help solve the misinformation problem, for example, but antitrust is a big part of the platform regulation discussion these days. Uh, and then lastly, you know, it, it, this is, is, you know, turns the lens back on us. Media literacy. Should we be training ourselves better to navigate this very complex news ecosystem? Should we be training our children from a young age? Maybe some of us old folks, maybe it's too late for us. Um, you know, we're just not going to have the skill set to be able to navigate effectively this news environment. Maybe we need to, you know, but, you know, in other countries, news literacy and media literacy training happens in elementary school. There are 14, maybe a few more states since I last put this together with some form of media literacy education requirements in their school systems. Um, we may see this grow in the years to come, but maybe you know this is too big and complex a space for government to effectively police, for the platforms to effectively do a good job themselves. Um, that maybe the onus ultimately is on us as news consumers and we need to figure out a way to uh, 
sort of, you know, cultivate demand from a very young age for the type of journalism that facilitates an informed citizenry and the effective functioning of the democratic process and also comes with the skill set that allows us to effectively distinguish the good from the bad, the true from the false, the trustworthy from the unreliable. So that's that's another frontier that perhaps we need to consider. Um, so this is just a you know a sampling of the kinds of solutions that we are you know kicking around at this point. Uh, and sadly, these are all with question marks at this point because we can't say much of this has been implemented uh, yet uh, here in the U.S. So I will stop there. Apologies for, for running a little bit long. Happy to take any additional questions. So, um, so I, I do have a follow-on question to that. Um, with, with regards to, to government involvement um, in the short term, is does that seem like maybe the only solution? From my perspective, I see um, these opinion presenters. I don't I don't know what you would call them in in the business, but. They're, they they get on and they and they espouse their opinion as if it's fact, if if, if this as if this is news and mm -hmm. it's true, and it sometimes is so hard to to distinguish between that and actual news that you know is there is there a place at this point in time for the government to have some kind of involvement in regulating that it's i mean it would be so hard just you know in light of how the courts have interpreted the first amendment as a, in, uh, at this point just to give you a sense of where uh, the, the legal doctrine around falsity is for example there was a case about a, a decade or so back where a political candidate lied, absolutely lied about his service record in violation of an existing law called the Stolen Valor Act, which made it a crime to lie about your military service record. The Supreme Court overturned and made declared that law unconstitutional. Essentially, that an intentional and overt lie in the midst of a political campaign is protected by the First Amendment. And it's based on this idea, this, I would argue, very outmoded idea that we can rely on counter speech. That is, if you're hearing these sort of opinions that are being disguised as fact and they're um, deceitful and they're misinforming, unfortunately, the predominant First Amendment interpretation at this point is one that says, well, Fortunately, we can count on somebody correcting that misinformation and you being exposed to that and the problem being you know, solved that way. Now, that flies in the face of a concept that I didn't talk about here, but maybe some of you may have been familiar, be familiar with, which is this idea of filter bubbles, which is in fact, you know, to some degree, and the research is, you know, goes both ways to a bit on this, that we are able in this environment to craft news feeds for ourselves where we might never be exposed to the accurate counter uh, information. Or more importantly, we are, many of us so polarized that even if we are exposed to it, we don't believe it. So it, you know, there's a huge amount of naivete at this point to how we have tradition, how we have interpreted the first amendment and how it operates in this space. Now, the example you were talking about is really interesting because in the broadcast context, the fairness doctrine actually prevented that. The fair, when the fairness doctrine went away, that's when we suddenly saw the skyrocketing ascendancy of political talk radio. Political talk radio could not exist until the fairness doctrine went away. Because imagine if every time you said something that was strong opinion on an issue, that somebody who disagreed with you could file a fairness doctrine complaint and you would have to give that person equal time. That's how the fairness doctrine worked. And it did have, and it applied only to broadcasting. Cannot emphasize that enough. We've never had a fairness doctrine that applied to newspapers. The Supreme Court overturned that argument because the notion was that broadcasting was unique and it used the spectrum and only a public resource like that could be regulated in that way. But yes, um, that's the one example then where we've had government regulation step in to sort of curtail exactly what you're seeing as problematic. 
People have tried to, you know, argue that that should extend to cable or to the internet, et cetera. Um, and we've yet to see that happen. So one, one, I have one last follow on, and then we do have a number of questions in the chat. Um, so is there any, um, would it be effective to take legal recourse? For instance, um, the, the voting machine companies file lawsuits against uh, Fox News and some personalities. And is, is, is that maybe a deterrent, a good deterrent? Or is it hard to prove that under the First Amendment? Yeah, the, the burden of proof in those kind of cases is incredibly high. Um, and the one thing that always bothered me about that as, as, as our, as our sort of safeguard mechanism, a couple of things, actually, one is yes, um, it applies to, you know, specifically to, you know, libelous and defamatory statements. And if you think about all the ways you could misinform somebody about an election where you might, you could say something or report something that doesn't tarnish the reputation of a particular individual or organization, that leaves a lot of opportunities uh, for misinforming folks on the table still. Uh, that was what was so interesting about this case is that, you know, Dominion uh, voting machines saw their reputation as being damaged, uh, and so they are taking action. Now, there does seem to have been an effect on these lawsuits already. Uh, if, you know, there's been lots of interesting video, in fact, of some of the news networks that have been um, prior to the lawsuits, um, you know, very free with letting people spout conspiracy theories about the election, for example, on their broadcasts. And they have been much more um, hesitant to do that. Uh, if, you've, if you saw, I can't remember which network it was that just basically, uh, you know, the host walked off because he didn't want to hear the my pillow guy go on and on anymore, uh, and he, he was—you could tell—he was like, yeah, "I don't want to be part of this lawsuit." As he was listening to this guy spout some, some, you know, what were at that point demonstrated falsities. So it can have that disciplining effect. But the other part of it I don't like too is it sort of puts enforcement only in the hands of those who have the inclination and the resources to file these lawsuits. And so when we talk about even repealing or modifying Section 230. That's what we're talking about is now opening up Facebook and Google and Twitter to these same lawsuits. So Dominion has no right under Section 230, no ability to sue Facebook or Twitter or anybody else who might have helped amplify certain falsities. But if Section 230 were revised, then they could. But again, um, it, it puts the power in the hands of and the enforcement responsibility in the hands of, of those who have the resources and the wherewithal to, to pursue these kind of lawsuits. Okay, so I'm gonna go through um, some of the questions that are in the chat. So they some of them go back to some earlier slides. Um, there, there's a question here. Do you have examples of communities that have figured out um, measures to continue to fund local news? Well, that's a great question. Um, the best example I can think of, this happened in, in New Jersey. Um, in New Jersey, the, the state had some broadcast licenses that they were not using. Uh, so there was some a spectrum that they could auction off. So they auctioned off the spectrum to commercial bidders and they took a chunk of that revenue I, and, you know, small in this case, I think it was only $5 million. But that $5 million has gone to a local news fund to provide support uh, for non-commercial local news sources operating in the state. Um, so that's one I would I would point to. Uh, we have here in North Carolina the North Carolina Local News Lab Fund. Now it's a number of foundations that are kicking in to some folks who are here on the ground in North Carolina who then. Um, you know, evaluate the situation here and make grants, once again, to local news sources to um, figure out, you know, in some cases to experiment, or in some cases to try to fill gaps um, that exist in coverage in the state. So that's another one. And then a third one is operating nationally, and that's Report for America. 
Um, it's taking the Teach for America model and essentially, which was let's take young uh, aspiring teachers and put them in communities around the country where there's a shortage of teachers. Well, this is doing the same thing, but with young journalists. Um, and we've actually done some of the research that Report for America uses, where we've tried to sort of map out the distribution of uh, journalists across the country. And that way they can identify areas where there's a shortfall and put journalists there. So those are just some off the top of my head of, of models that are, that are being put into place these days. So, um, so a, a follow up kind of a follow on to that is where, where is the money coming from for the news that we are hearing? So foundations are playing a bigger role in this space than they, than they have before, uh, but still advertising, uh, you know, it's not all gone, uh, but certainly advertising is still, is still a bigger part. Now, what's interesting over the past four years and the, uh, coronavirus contributed to this to this as well, is the degree to which people are willing to pay for news has been on an upswing. And the interesting question people are asking is now that um, the past four years and we've had a change in administration um, is, you know, and, you know, it's a less dramatic, contentious, whatever you want to call it, political, uh, you know, White House, at least for the for the moment that that actually, you know, we're seeing some indications that sort of consumer demand for news is actually on the downslide again, which again is unfortunate to think that our interest in news is so crisis and drama driven. Um, that again, that, that reflects poorly on us uh, as news consumers. Uh, so, um, you know, news organizations, have they figured out alternative revenue streams at this point really beyond the traditional subscription dollars and, advertising well you know again there's you know there's the influx of foundation dollars there's the influx of dollars from the big digital platforms facebooks and googles etc and then on the horizon is the question of whether we might see um you know tax dollars uh allocated in some you know uh objective and fair way uh to um to, to new sources um so it sounds like then that that um the the source is these mega media companies. I mean the Facebooks, the CBSs, the the Fox Network. The yeah okay. Yeah, our, and it's interesting. I have some data on this. I didn't put it in the slides, but you know, the production of journalism is becoming more concentrated. The the journalism jobs are becoming more concentrated. We are seeing them leave, we've used Bureau of Labor Statistics data to map this out essentially. We've seen journalism jobs leave the middle of the country and become heavily clustered in the Bay Area, DC and New York. I, I think I have this number right, but something in the neighborhood of 40 plus percentage of all journalists work in those three areas geographically. Wow. That sort of goes to show too how the economics of national journalism are much healthier than the economics of local journalism. All right. Um, I think that's all the questions that were in the chat. Did, does anybody else have any questions? I'd like to throw in, this is great stuff. Local newspapers are not only endangered. I mean, St. Uh, New Orleans, Salt Lake City, have no daily newspaper. Yep. And it's gonna happen to Greensboro, it's gonna happen to Durham. These, these chains that keep these local newspapers alive now are gonna give up yep. in two years, five years. You know, their the profit margins now, they're owned by bigger companies. So I think the local business community, if you know that your government may fund some of this stuff, but the bigger role I think they can play, although I've not been able to get any interest in Greensboro yet, is by marshalling their business community to say, we all benefit from having a daily newspaper here and, and we should join together and support it. Um, Cause it's gonna just go away. <laughs> well, that is a, that's a great point. And that's, a, you know, I, I, that's a, it's an interesting additional solution path to pursue. Um, and it's sort of interesting because if you think about, you know, and the challenge there I think has been too, you know, the ways in which some of these same forces have affected local businesses 
and their ability to advertise and the way in which the Amazons as such have come in and sort of decimated um, you know, their revenue streams. So that, 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 that sector weakens you know, in parallel with this, which is extra frustrating. And we all have these big companies that have never seen fit to advertise locally. I know, you know, Greensboro does, but if you tell them, you know, you're going to lose this local newspaper, the community is going to the common ground that people find in a newspaper that they don't find anywhere else is going to disappear. In Greensboro, we might be able to get the Volvos or the, uh, you know, other big companies that otherwise don't advertise locally. Perhaps they and that, can be. Uh, yep. And that gets to this idea of really needing to think about local journalism as a public good, the way we would think about education or museums or, or the opera, or any of these things that we, we generally don't expect the market to be able to support effectively, but have this collective value that we don't want to lose. That, to me, is the right way, the essential way, to be thinking about local journalism. And so it's hard because we, we've all grew up with this idea of it being a viable business, and it's a major perceptual shift. And even, and that is the interesting thing, you even talk to journalists, even many, many journalists don't want to give up on this idea that um, they can operate as these independent commercial entities. Uh, so, uh, and, and are very resistant to these sources of funding that they are concerned could have, you know, uh, corrupting uh, influences, which is a fair concern. Uh, so we have to figure out ways to do it that, that insulate them. But uh, you know, I've I've been on record for a while now saying, you know, we have to stop kidding ourselves that there's a you know that there's a commercial version of lo of local journalism in our future. We need to treat it as a public good, um, you know, and and support it uh, the way we've supported other kinds of arts and culture and educational endeavors in our communities. This sounds like a perfect job for the League of Women Voters. Go get them, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. Um, we're we're going to have to um, end this at this point, but I want to thank you, Dr. Napoli, for participating tonight and, and uh, giving us a lot to think about. <clears throat> the media and uh, journalism has such an important role to play in our democracy. <clears throat> I just want to remind... I want to remind everybody um, that the final lecture in our series will be next Tuesday, May 4th. The topic will be on voting rights and will be presented by Robert Korstad of Duke University and James Lelotus of UNC Chapel Hill. And I wanna thank you everybody for attending tonight. <clears throat> Bob, the colleague of mine at Stanford School, so I can vouch for him, he will give you a great talk. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you.